I walked out and Harmon was standing in the room out outside the little library. And I said to him, my gosh, somebody's got to write a book about Gary. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> and he said, he said, you're right. Today, we are talking with a very cool bassist who wrote a book that is a must read for anyone interested in the double bass in my book. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. We're talking today with Mary Ranney, who is the principal double bass for the Victoria Symphony in British Columbia, Canada, and is also the author of Life on the G-String, which is the biography of Gary Carr. What a work, what a process it was to put this together. This book debuted, I believe if I'm getting my facts right, at the 2017 International Society of Basis Convention, which was the 50th anniversary convention. Mary was there. I was there. I remember checking out the book in 2017 and thinking, wow, this is very cool. But then when I started to put together some base history videos on my YouTube channel, I decided to give this book another read. And I just am so in love with this book and in awe of this book. And it just is so interesting to really put myself in Gary Carr's shoes, which this book does, and think about what it was like and being such a pioneer like he was. So one night, late at night, as I often do, I reached out to Mary and said, would you like to talk about this book? And she said yes. And I love this conversation. I hope you enjoy it. We get into all kinds of things about process and this quite lengthy process that this was putting this book together. Uh, it's just a lot of fun, lots of laughs along the way. I know you're going to enjoy this. Quick shout out to our sponsors, Dorico, Ear Trumpet Labs, and Modacity. More on them later. But let's get into this conversation with Mary Ranny. I've been getting more into like just reading books about bass the last few months and and I dug into it again and it's just it's so so well written and researched and it's just so just thank you for doing that what must have been probably how many years were you working on that probably almost a decade I, I guess I hate to say it but it was 14 years wow wow <laughs> yeah I I love having ideas and following through with them I don't care how long they take usually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm not like Gary. When he gets an idea, he he acts on it right away. It's done, <laughs> moves on to another thing. And and I just always kind of laughed at at the length of time this was taking, knowing that he's probably just wishing, wishing, wishing it could could move faster. <laughs> But I did it at my pace and there was there was stuff happening in my life and everything so I needed to take it at my own pace. Okay. Well, I knew it was a bunch of years cuz you mentioned in the book how you, or you over 8 summers you were showing things to students and and the like. So yeah. so I knew it was at least approaching a decade, so even over a decade. That's that's incredible. Did you ever think this is never going to be finished? I mean, when you're working on a project that long, it's like the doctoral dissertation that just never gets done, perhaps. I knew it was going to get done at some, you know, at some point. Okay. I, I knew that it was something that, and after a while, you've worked on it so long, there's no way you wouldn't <laughs> finish it. But I just never knew how long it would take. And, and it was fine the way it worked out. It, it went you know, when you're writing this, mm -hmm. when you're writing about somebody, you have to get it right. That was topmost in my mind. I've, I've got to get get this right. Mm -hmm. And it has, I, I work at a pace where I, when I feel something's right, I that's good. And then I can do another bit and it, it just takes time. I, I can't even imagine, the, the thought of writing a biography terrifies me just because uh, like like telling someone's story like that, you, you really do want to get it right, you know, and it's, and um, what, what we're doing here, this is like one one thousandth of the work or less than that, of like putting something together. We could tell a story, but it's like we're having a conversation, but my goodness, to go through all that material. Um, I remember talking to Gary and Harmon a few years ago about, because I think Harmon is the, the information collection collector out of the two of them, right? Isn't he the person who saved the programs and all that kind of thing? Am I remembering that right? You're probably right. Okay. I'm sure he was, he, they had um, 25 scrapbooks 
And then towards the end, there were no scrapbooks. The scrapbooks were done by Sarah Klein and three other women friends. They put these books together. They were amazing. But the very beginning was a bit sketchy. It was more like just photographs and the odd thing in boxes. And then at the end, those last years were sketchy too. <laughs> and there was nothing, there, were, there weren't the scrapbooks anymore. So that meant I had to go through everything. And, and I, I literally went through everything they, they had so, so as somebody who does a lot of projects, nothing to this extent, but like, how the heck do you even start looking at all that information and, and turning it into what also becomes like a, a, a well-paced, interesting biography? Like, were you, were you taking notes as you were going through or were you, how, how were you even starting to categorize all this information? <laughs> well, you know, it took me five years to actually copy make physical copies of 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 the stuff from his books and boxes that i felt were important i didn't even use it yet but i would quickly scan everything and copy it so that i had it all in my own home Mm. that took five years (laughs) (laughs) and um I mean, I guess I'm not the fastest worker, but I also wanted it to be all at home with me. So I wasn't running over to their house a lot. Not that I, did, I didn't want to do that. I, but we also had 11 interviews, uh, which I then transcribed and I, by hand, you see, and then, then typed. And you know, it, all, it all took ages. Oh. But, but it's the way I needed to have it. I needed everything with me. At all times, you don't know you don't know how you're going to end up writing that or telling this the tale. So you kind of need all that information in front of you. And as somebody who's I've transcribed a little bit of what I what I've done over the past. I mean, that's just like that. I don't ever want to transcribe another thing again in my life. And I, <laughs> I did not have to transcribe eleven interviews uh, from from them. That's that's incredible. Um, do, so the scrapbooks had been done prior to you starting all this. Yep, in their b- bookshelves, all lined up. So, so how did the idea happen? Was that your idea? Was that you were just chatting with them or you were chatting with other people? How did you, when did the vision for this come to you? Well, actually, I, I taught at uni- the University of Victoria here in uh, Victoria. And I would, Gary would actually come and give one master class a month to them. Mm-hmm. It was great. And I was in the li- his library one time looking at looking for music, perhaps that would be of interest. And I walked out and Harmon was standing in the room out, outside the little library. And I said to him, my gosh, somebody's got to write a book about Gary. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> and he said, he said, you're right. So I don't think I thought I could do it, but. It took a few months, and obviously the idea percolated in my head. And then there was a class that I sat and watched Gary teach this master class to my students. And I sat there, and I'm always amazed at his teaching. And I suddenly thought, my gosh, I wonder if I can do this. (laughs) (laughs) And I was so excited at the thought that perhaps maybe I could, that I went by a bookstore on my way home from the class and I actually bought a book about writing. And I got home and I said to my husband, Jerry, I think I'm gonna write a book about Gary Carr. And he was just as excited as I was. And he didn't know I was gonna take this long. (laughs) He was very patient too. And, I still let myself, I I tried writing a little bit and I, from what I knew about him. And then I decided to ask them if, you know, it's always them because they're, they're joined at the hip. Mm -hmm. And um, so I asked them out for dinner and I I said, okay, we're going to play a game. First, I had a big glass of wine (laughs) before they got there. 
<laughs> and then I said, I, I, I want you to guess why I've called you here. <laughs> you know, the old line. And um, it took five minutes. And, and Gary said, you want to write a book about me? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes. And they both said, great. So that was it. <laughs> That was it. <laughs> no, now had you, I, I, and I know journalism is in the family, right? Wasn't your dad a newspaper editor? Did I read that in your body? So had you done r much writing over the years? Or this was kind of a new thing? No. Okay. It was all new to me. Well, I mean, I certainly had witnessed him write many books about subjects that hadn't been written about. Mm -hmm. And be an editor of, of this newspaper and everything. So I knew what it was like, sort of. I just, I love good writing, and I felt I wanted, I wanted to take up the challenge mm -hmm. of trying to write well and do, do this book about someone who needed, who really needed to be written about. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the advanced music notation software from Steinberg. And one of the coolest things about this piece of software, there's so many things, but one of them is their popover option. And it has sped up things so much for me when I'm working in scores. Here's senior product manager, Daniel Spreadbury on how popover mode works. There's like hundreds of notations that you might want to create and trying to remember what to type, you know, oh, is it command shift alt, you know, Vulcan death grip seven <laughs> for this particular notation but the nice thing about a popover is all you have to remember is the letter of the thing you want to create so d for dynamics t for tempo m for meter k for key signature it might seem like a simple thing but you would not believe how much that has sped up my workflow and i'm not even really a composer i do a lot of arrangements i do a lot of exercises but it has taken my workflow probably at least up to five times faster just that one mode i can't say enough good things about dorico i love it i use it every single day there's a free version dorico sc that you can download that lets you do practically everything for up to two stabs so check it out dorico.com will take you to their page on steinberg's website and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast this episode is brought to you by ear trumpet labs they make an incredible mic for upright bass called the nadine and six time grammy winning jazz bassist and former contra bass conversations guest christian mcbride is a big fan christian says as an acoustic bassist it's very important for me to have this instrument amplified as naturally as possible what i love about this microphone is that it makes the instrument sound exactly how I hear it in my head. Honestly, I don't know if you can get a better review than that. The Nadine is an instrument-mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear natural sound and great feedback rejection. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt with mic purchase from their website. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and learn more about Nadine. Yeah, you know, reading through it, I mean, his career, this is obvious to anybody who's listening, but his career is is so fascinating and takes so many unexpected turns. And reading it just made me remember what, I mean, everybody knows he's a, what a pioneer he was. But when you actually go back in time as you read this and you think about what it was like, you know, in the 60s, what it must have been like for him and all these, you know, he's, he's uh, all this, the, you know, he was playing orchestra gigs. And then he started, I mean, I think people think he just like popped popped out, you know, becoming this solo. Like, it's just really interesting to follow the from his young years and the Hollywood scene. And, and, and I mean, just what a remarkable. And then one of the pivot points in his life that I think is just so surprising is when he went to teach public school in in Canada, right? That, 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 like, if you were, if you were tra making a timeline of someone's career, it, even though it was still, he was breaking ground, it all kind of made sense. And then all of a sudden he did that. And I remember talking to him about that a few years ago, back when he was still splitting his time between Las Vegas and Canada and, yeah. and, and getting his impressions. But what, uh, I don't even, I don't even have a good question here, but I mean, just like w how remarkable it must have been for you to go through it and just sort of document this. I mean, was was what what was that experience like for you just like digging in and going back in time like that well because i'm a bass player and i had i had a career as a you know in an orchestra i would hear things about gary carr or you you just hear things but i wasn't the type of person to go and investigate much mm -hmm. particularly I, I just had this 
little bit of knowledge that he he had taught in Halifax. Mm -hmm. That's all I knew. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was ukulele, a ukulele class or something. It, it did make sense that he went there in a way. I think he wanted a, a, a bit of a slower life. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, from New York. And everything worked the way it seemed to work through his life to guide him in, in the direction, in that direction. The man he talked to said he knew somebody in Halifax and he who, who was telling him they needed a teacher and Gary just just took it you know yeah. he wanted to try to 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 keep classical music alive and keep the younger generations aware of the whole uh, of classical music and he wanted to to he wanted that challenge and it was a challenge for him. He said it was pretty hard work sometimes, but he loved it. Yeah, it must have been a crazy challenge. And then what a radical change from his New York life. I mean, reading as you describe the pace of life that he was living in New York, because he was, he was, remind me everything he was doing at that time prior to Halifax. He was teaching in the city. He was teaching at Juilliard, but he was also, was he driving up to, where was he driving up to? He was driving up north somewhere and then playing. And there were just so many different things. I don't remember. It was Yale he was teaching at or yeah it was Yale okay. and and um Boston you mm. see he, he he would go to Boston and talk and and meet with oh dear the string pedagogue there um Bornoff oh okay and together they Bornoff was trying to do a series of books of of, of string stuff and Gary wanted to do help him with the bass books. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that happened, but Gary did his own, made, wrote his own books later on. Gary was not sure that his own method was something that lent itself to an official method. Mm -hmm. So it took him till the 90s, mid 90s to 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 take up that challenge himself. You know, Gary Carr walks into a room uh, and and there's energy happens, you know, and I mean, I, 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 I remember the first time everybody probably has a meeting Gary Carr for the first time story. Me, I was, I think, 14 years old, growing up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and he came and he was the soloist with the South Dakota Symphony, I, you know, which he did a lot, a lot of that sort of thing back, back in those days. This was late 80s, early 90s. And I mean, just like I, th there was me before that concert and me after that concert. And I was in Mexico with Gary maybe three years ago at, at this event. And, you know, you just see all these bassists. They see Gary and their eyes light up. And, 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 you know, I, I was coaching this string quartet and Gary would just pop in every once in a while and say something you see and you just saw them that, you know, just the energy radiating. And, um, mm. When did you first meet Gary? You know, I don't have that first memory that you talk about, but I knew about him and I worked in Thunder Bay, Ontario. I'm not sure if it was there. I think it was here in Victoria. Mm -hmm. I came here when in, in 19... 79. I've been here a long time. And um, naturally, he played with the symphony and he here because he taught here in the summers. By then, he taught here at um, a, a festival every summer for about six weeks. So we were the orchestra he played with. And that's where I got to know Gary Carr. Okay. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And he helped me. I had problems. My shoulders were hurting. And 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 he said, come to my class. Let's see how you're doing. <laughs> and uh, I came and I played for, for kids. And, you know, here am I in my career full swing. And they'd say, oh, look, her, she's leaning forward. Mm -hmm. And just the things that he would talk about to them. And they could see me doing these, you know, creating problems for myself. Mm -hmm. So he was very, very generous. And I gradually started taking his classes every summer as well and teaching ESL to the kids, uh, taking some of the foreign kids and helping them with their English. And so I, you know, I, I saw him at work and play a lot. <laughs> so, so, you know, I was very lucky. I was in the, in the really the best position to, to, take on a project about his life because I could see how, how he lived. 
and it's a life that seems so exciting from the outside to many people, but anybody who's been a touring musician in any capacity uh, knows how demanding that can be to people I talk to in the jazz world and just the, the stresses of that. Uh, and then especially if you're carrying a bass around to boot, you know, that, <laughs> it's, it's, know. it's, it's uh, yeah, it, it, I just feel the fatigue reading. And so like what, <laughs> how, how great that must have been for him and for them to open up all that space you know retiring from that life and 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 you can just see if you look at the projects he's done since then you know all these sort of things that would have been so difficult to do being on the road like that i know and he really loves having another project ahead of him so he certainly didn't stop how did that feel in 2017, getting that book done. That must have been so sad. I mean, that, 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 that was like, you know, it's almost like the length of time of a kid being born and graduating from high school. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they, they would have entered high school if they had been born at the time of that book. How, how did that feel for you? Did it, was it like a weight was lifted or like actually to finally have this physical thing out in the world, the result of all those years? Oh, yeah. No, it felt absolutely fantastic. And there was still a lot, a, a lot to do. You know, I'm, I realize I'm an introvert. I've realized in the last few years that I'm an introvert. And, and it's, that's, that was the next part, to get it out mm -hmm. at, at a couple of book signings and mm -hmm. go to the conference and all that. And that was a big thing. This was pretty big for a small town girl. Well, and as someone who, who labels themselves an introvert, you must have been exhausted at that convention. I mean, I got tired just like looking at Gary, you know, even if it, if, if the, if the gaze was directed largely at Gary or Gary and Harmon still, I mean, the, the, uh, you know, I get exhausted at those events, you know, not having a book about me out or anything like that. Were you, were you wiped out by the end of that time there? Actually, I wasn't. I was probably pretty pumped by the whole thing, you know. Oh, cool. Okay. Just pumped yeah. up. Just... Wow. And Sarah, I, I sold the book at the place where Sarah Klein sells Gary's CDs and T-shirts and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So so we worked together, and it was it was a great time. People have been saying such great things about my course with Discover Double Bass, Beginner's Classical Bass. Here is Nicholas Walker, professor of double bass at Ithaca College and past president of the International Society of Basses. Nicholas writes, Jason draws from this vast network with his contagious enthusiasm and love of learning. Presented through the beautifully organized and easily accessible framework of Discover Double Bass, this is a terrific learning experience for any beginner, as well as a great model for any new teacher. I am blushing, Nicholas. Thank you so much. I'm just so thrilled with how this course came out. Jeff Chalmers and the whole team at Discover Double Bass are so professional. It was such a great experience, and it was the best representation of what I would love to take every single beginner through in terms of format and presentation, and I'm just, I'm just so happy that it's out there. You can learn more. We've got a link in the show notes, or you can just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath. Here's Mark Gelfo from Modacity on the concept of exaggerated errors. Well, if you're going to make a mistake, Jason, you might as well have black as you make you no, you should really exaggerate your errors when you're practicing. First of all, it brings a great sense of humor when you miss a note and you miss it again even worse. And second of all, it actually helps you identify the physiological or mental processes that led to the creation of that error in the first place. And it sort of takes any charge away from that error. Exaggerate your errors and then just let it go and have a couple free free trials or you know swings without trying to control how things go once you've exaggerated the error the body will often eliminate it automatically you can learn more about my favorite practice app and get a special deal on lifetime membership by visiting modacity.co slash cbc and thank you modacity for sponsoring the podcast well, it's the sort of thing that I wish was out there for more of those figures that everybody should know about and needs to know about. And the discography, I mean, just the details that you've got in there, the work you put into it, it's really, it's its a must read for sure. I should have talked to you in 2017 about it when it came out, but <laughs> I just, the pandemic got me got me reading again. And I just remembered how how well done th the that book is just overall. So uh, can, just congratulations. Well, thank you. And we <laughs> We, you know, Gary had a joke that he would tell when he and Harmon would do children's concerts. Um, he'd say, now Harmon here, he has a PhD. He knows everything there is to know about music. 
and I know all the rest. <laughs> so I would tell Gary and Harmon that now I know everything there is to know about Gary, but Harmon knows all the rest. <laughs> and we love that because, you know, you can't put everything in a book. Yeah. You can't, you just can't get everything. And there's, there's a lot that didn't get there. I'll bet. And I, and as, as someone who's done far less ambitious projects like that, you know, I, I watched my giant pile of things I've written, you know, they slowly condense. What, what was the, how big was the book at its biggest before you started cut or maybe, maybe um, I don't know how you worked exactly on it, but I'm, I, I'm, sh I can only imagine there must've been a lot that you had to cut just to make it not a thousand pages. Yeah, there was probably 500. There were, there were probably 500 pages that needed to be pared down. They made a good story. You know, after my first interview with Gary, I said, oh, no, there's so much here. I, I just didn't know that. I'll know all this. And he said, um, makes a good story. <laughs> <laughs> he knew it did. And he was he's, he was very happy to have someone tell it because he didn't want to do it. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's it's incredible. I, I just wish that if we could go back in time, we could have similar books written about somebody like Kusevitsky or or um, Von Hall or some of these figures, just like what their lives must have been like, you know, and I like know. getting on the train with your base Bottazzini. Like what on earth was it was that like? So I, it's so it's so yeah. great and important, I think, to have something like this that that people can look back on. And just and again, like like I was saying a few minutes ago, it, it made me realize just what a pioneer he was and how yes. how out there he must have felt on the on the edge of you know bass is still as a solo instrument you know it's not necessarily the first thing people think of and we've come so far <laughs> from from uh gary in the 60s you know getting his career going so it just it it's it's uh, so uh wonderfully captures just that time and what that must have been like and how brave really uh, the choice to do that was and and the psychology behind the, the choices he was making so again very well written yeah well he he just followed his his star mm -hmm. you know that's what he wanted to do he mm -hmm. couldn't not do that mm -hmm. he was destined to do that he he said he want remember he said he wanted to he thought he'd be a baby doctor <laughs> bring babies into the world mm -hmm. and and he did kind of want to do that but this was he couldn't not do this. So, yeah. well, Mary, thank you. I, I will link up obviously to the book so people can check out. Do you want me to send people anywhere else besides uh, the book? Um, ISB is selling it, of course, and um, Amazon does sell it, and my website sells it. Uh, PayPal, you just pay by PayPal and pick it up there. Or, um, gee, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think if there's something here that um, I really would like to say. Yeah, please. Anything, anything you want to get out there. Um, the title, the title came to me one day, very late in the process. Mm -hmm. And all through the time I was trying to write the book, I often said, I'm trying to write a book about <laughs> Gary Carr. Um, I thought the title would be lyrical reflections and they had a pool, a base-shaped pool in their back yard. And I thought that could be on the cover and this would be called Lyrical Reflections. I loved that title. But one day it hit me, life on the G-string. And I thought, nope, that's the one. Because, it, you know, the G-string is the high string. It's the, the string we fear. It's the one that we're... <laughs> We can express ourselves up there on, but the irony is, of course, that he played on the A string. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good For point. Him, it was the A string. <laughs> I love. I never thought of that. That's that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there's a, also a funny part of that when. Um, it came out on Amazon. There were several ads for G strings, <laughs> <laughs> and I blushed or something and then uh, i thought well and then they disappeared those disappeared <laughs> that is hilarious <laughs> <laughs> and then the cover was 
another that was another good thing inside the i guess the first the front page has a cartoon of gary perched on the base and he's it's a cartoon the base is big and he's little and he's perched up there reaching down sort of and it was made by a south african artist who who now lives in toronto of all places mm. but I wanted that cartoon on the cover because it said everything. It was somebody perching on the edge of a career, you know, that that was hard. It was hard. And he had a smile on his face in that cartoon and he just smiled his way through it. But it was tough. So that's what I wanted. And then I sent it to my uh, I chose a local publisher and sent I had already given all the photos from the middle of the book to them, to the publisher. He chose the one of Gary kissing his base. Mm. And he sent back mine on it and my cover, but then he sent this. He said, ha, just have a look at this. And I looked and I knew that was the one because it said it all even more. It said it, it said the, you know, it, it, it had the love in there. Yeah. And um, so that was, and then I had my sister-in-law do the calligraphy on the front and my brother set it up and it, and it was just, I love the cover. I'll always love that cover. So I, I did want to say that. Yeah, it's amazing what getting the right photo, just the, the magic that that can capture. It's a, it's a lovely photo. So good, good, good choice. I know. Yeah. I love and it. one of the many tough decisions putting something like this together, people might not even think about, but you know, that's, a, that's, that's your, your billboard for your book right there, that cover. I know. And you just, you know, you have to get it right. And that can take time. You don't want to make the wrong decision. It has to sit for a long time. And that's also the process of writing a book. You have to sit with the things that will go in the book. And then after a while, you think, no, no, that, that I don't need that. But I need more of this. And it, it was a labor of love. And it was, it was just a, a wonderful challenge that I will, it, it fulfilled my fulfilled me to be a to be a writer mm -hmm. i often called it wordsmithing because i'm putting together everything i'm reading and hearing mm -hmm. and i loved i loved it that yeah that whole synthesis process wordsmithing is a good a good word for it for sure yeah that's like a whole era of your life working on that book that's incredible yeah <laughs> i know and people say are you going to write another and i i don't think so because I couldn't feel more strongly about anything than I did about this. Yeah, it's hard to follow up something of that that magnitude in terms of time and and research and and the like. So, but if 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 you do get inspired and write something and uh, and you're you're digging into some of the base topic, uh, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it earlier. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Well, the other thing I wanted to say was the responsibility of writing about the great Gary Carr was that's what was so important to get right. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and and the humor, you know, I loved I loved the humor that he he knew what was funny and he he would exploit it he loved it and he reminded me of our canadian humorist stephen leacock who is just he was he is just so funny he was so funny and uh, i love 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 that kind of humor and so that drove me on to <laughs> i guess that i guess that's it well, g g great job and congratulations. And you definitely captured that humor on the page, you know, which can be tough to do, you know, from, from the, the, the in-person experience of somebody like Gary Carr. And I love the book. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep recommending it till the cows come home. So and th thank you for taking some time out and, and hanging out over Zoom.
Mary, thank you so much for chatting. MaryRenny.com is her website. The book is linked up there too. I've got a link to it on Amazon as well. You can get it through the ISB store, which I believe she mentioned. And yeah, check it out. It is definitely a must read in my opinion. And I've got all kinds of great ideas for future video content or working what I learned in this book into future videos. And even if you're not planning on making videos, which most of you probably are not, uh, it's absolutely a great read, and it really, like I said in the intro and in, as I was talking with Mary, it really does put me in Gary Carr's shoes to an extent. I guess no one can really know exactly how he felt through those times, but I just think back to starting the ISB or what would become the ISB in the 60s, running around and doing all the teaching that he was doing, the performing, going to teach elementary school. I mean, what a cool career, and what a testament to... What you can do in the world of music, maybe that might sound cheesy, but Gary is, I, I, he's turning 80 this year and he is still playing great. He is still doing so many cool things. What a vibrant person and great force in the musical world. So thank you, Gary, for what you do. And thank you, Mary, for writing this book. Contrabass Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Mitch Mooring, and Trevor Jones. Mitch makes beautiful basses in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Learn more at MitchMooring.com. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.